Today, uh, we have Larry Chambers, and I'm going to say just a bit about him in a second, but uh, joined by two medical students, and I'll mention them in a second. But the subject today is a, a very apropos in this community. Except I just look around at the demographics, <coughs> and I'm one of you. So it's uh, Niagara's aging population. Uh, who will support those too frail to live at home? Well, that's one of the major issues. So, um, uh, Larry Chambers is a professor uh, emeritus at, um, at McMaster, but he's now the research director of the Michael DeGroote School of Medicine here in Niagara. Uh, and um, and uh, that's the first such position, right? Not for you, but they, yeah. they've created it. So, so that's a big plus to bolster uh, research in this area. That's very important. Then we have Hannah uh, Luddy, right? Hannah, okay. And Eva Liu, did I pronounce that properly? Yes. Okay, good. I don't always get it right, but <laughs> anyway. So um, uh, before our speakers take over, I, this is an issue and, and it reflects the changing demographics, which they'll talk about and some of the cognitive uh, costs of aging, memory, social intelligence, orientation. I just read an interesting little article in the um, in, in nature this morning about head direction of neurons, and guess where they are, in the temporal lobe, uh, which might well be affected, and we already know there was a Nobel Prize given for positioning neurons in the temporal lobe, and guess what? Uh, patients with dementia often have problems with finding their way in their environment, so uh, no surprise there. So um, I, we're not going to say anything about the biology of aging, or I suppose you might, but, uh, but mostly it's a practical walkthrough, isn't it? And to deal with, uh, uh, try to state what the issues are and, uh, and what people can do to help themselves and what the community offers. Um, of what the community um, might offer them. And, uh, and so that, and that really involves the future, and it involves politicians as well as uh, physicians and nurses. And so it's really a very broad subject. So I don't know who's heading off. All right, Larry. So thank you, Bill, for inviting us to uh, come and speak today. Um, this is, uh, as you said, a, 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 a presentation that's that's aimed at the general public, not at um, not at scientists or health professionals. It's the general public. Um, we first wanted to say a bit about the land acknowledgement, um, Anna. Uh, so to begin the presentation, uh, we want to. Um, we want to acknowledge the land on which we gather, uh, that it's the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee people um, and the Adnashabi um, peoples as well, uh, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land protected by the Dish With One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and acknowledging reminds us that our great standard of living is directly related to the resources and friendship of Indigenous peoples. And uh, we'd just like to start with a disclaimer that the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in these presentations are solely belonging to the presenters and may not necessarily reflect the views of McMaster University or any other group. And we also wanted to give a thanks to everyone who helped us with the pre preparation of this presentation, <coughs> including Dr. Murray Gray for his fitness gap information, Megan Harris and Liz Lusk for their input in conceptualizing the upstream community-wide approach, and the residents in Niagara-on-the-Lake with whom we've discussed various aspects of the presentation. And finally, we'd like to give a special thanks to Dr. Bill Brown for scheduling us to be here heard through InfoHealth today. Okay, I can go this way. Uh, 
Um, so as Dr. Brown mentioned, we are students at uh, the Niagara Regional Campus, uh, Michael G. DeGroote School of Medicine, McMaster University. Um, our school has 85 medical students, 26 postgraduate trainees, 400 physician faculty, uh, and our support team based in the NRC office is on Brock University campus. The medical school here also has partnerships with many of the facilities within the Niagara region, including family physician offices in all 12 municipalities in Niagara, long-term care homes, Niagara Health, which includes five hospital, ne uh, hospital network, uh, the West Lincoln Memorial Hospital, Brock University's Faculty of Applied Health Sciences, Niagara College, Hotel Du Shaver, Health and Rehabilitation Center, and the Regional Municipality of Niagara, uh, which includes their public health and community services. Uh, and we just wanna say that we are really, really excited to be here in the Niagara region uh, learning, and we're happy to answer any questions you guys may have after the presentation. We'd love to speak to anybody who wants to speak to us. So the, the objectives of this uh, presentation this afternoon are um, fourfold. First of all, we want to talk about the physical and brain, the fitness, physical and brain gap. The second, uh, changing demographics. Third, how we support those who are too frail to live at home. And this will include um, housing options for older adults and health human resources, the health human resources crisis and the opportunity. And then we want to talk a little bit about how we can affect change and thinking um, what we call upstream thinking and community-wide strategies. Um, maintaining brain health and reducing risk of long-term conditions is, is a major focus here and uh, we want to um, expand on that a bit. First of all, there's, there's a lot of misinformation about, um, about brain health, but uh, these four, four factors are things that we should all think about if we're worried about our brain health. First of all, our ability to manage financial affairs. Second, our ability to take care of your medical conditions. Third, the ability to safely, without some, to live safely without someone else present. And also the ability to drive a car safely. So if you're having trouble with one or more of these things, that's when you probably should, should um, seek some help. Um, notice I left out some other things in there, in particular memory, because we get confused with memory, but these are all functional things that we need to do every day. In fact, I, I, I saw an article yesterday by this researcher at the um, at University of Colorado saying that um, the financial affairs is, a, is probably the best indicator of early, early signs of brain problems, and that banks should do more on this, and, and we should use that because it's going to be a long time before biology figures it out. The next uh, slide here talks about, um, about the level of ability at any age being determined in part by the maximum level before decline starts. So on the left hand um, um, vertical axis we see bone strength and on the bottom axis we see, we see age. And so at, at a point in life we, we gain maximum strength. So for example um, the average age for a marathoner is about 20, 28 years. So after that, they sort of go downhill with their speed. Um, and so we see here person A and person B. Person A might have been the marathoner and person B wasn't. And you'll see that um, person A is going to delay probably osteoporosis longer than person B. So it's never too late. Um, so there, it's never too late to close the, the fitness gap. Um, as I mentioned, we peak at different, age, di different ages um, and uh, on different, uh, different abilities. For example, apparently living a second, learning a second language uh, is best when you're about seven or eight. Um, uh, remembering unfamiliar names is best uh, at 22. Um, uh, Nobel Prize winners apparently uh, uh, discover most of their major discoveries when they're 40. And of course, we all, we all become much more wise as we get older. <laughs> so uh, we talk about optimal aging and we should strive for the best possible rate of decline in order to improve physical and brain health. 
If you do not use it, you lose it, is basically what it's all about. And, and we used to think that was important for physical health, but it's now well established in uh, neurosciences that the same applies to brain health. We weren't gonna go through that in detail, but um, it's, it all points to this, it's never too late to start improving your fitness. Um, this slide talks about brain health in particular. Um, each of these factors enhance and, and interact with each other. Like most things in life, it's complicated, but the, if you think about it in, in these three areas, keeping your brain health tissue, your, your, your brain tissue healthy, I should say, uh, that's, that would include getting more active and physically fitter, sleeping better, reducing stress and avoiding over, over medication, improving brain blood supply, everything that's good for your heart is good for your health, stopping smoking, keeping your blood pressure low, keeping your weight down, rebalancing your diet, and then finally increase engagement with others. Get even more active and in, involved in to minimize isolation and depression, increase intellectual activity, and check your hearing and vision. So um, things like start a new company or uh, become a volunteer or, or um, uh, join a group. So uh, these three people are, are uh, oh, sorry, we went too far. No, that guy, I guess he's gone. Oh, I, I missed it, I'm sorry. So the other thing about, um, about uh, ability and well-being is that we have these four processes going on all the time. And this, this slide summarizes all the gerontology science about aging in one slide. Um, and we need to accept and understand aging, keep, keep and get fitter, reduce the impact of disease, and think more positively. And these all are interact as shown here. So there are many studies that have shown this. I'm particularly interested in supercentenarians. People live over 110, and they all do really well on these, these criteria. So the, the next slide shows these three people hiking in the hills. And again, closing the fitness gap here through multi-generational activities is also good for you. So um, we want to give you a job now. Uh, uh, if you can talk to your neighbor over the next two minutes answering this question, can the locations where frail older adults live help them with closing their fitness gap, physical and brain gap? So I'll give you, I'll give you two minutes to talk to your neighbor about the answer to this question. And if you're at home uh, watching this, you should talk to whoever you're watching this with to figure it out.
and it's very important in, in the winter that may be a little more difficult certainly outside a little more challenging but you can do it inside and I think a lot of people do they use the community center for that the pillar and post the Prince of Wales uh, Queensland <coughs> all have pools all have exercise facilities that people can use so they're there and from what I can see a lot of people use them. okay another answer back here somewhere Yes? But that's all well and good, but if you've lost your driver's license, you can be yes. very isolated. Yes. And, uh, yeah. It's hard to get around to do these things to yes. keep yourself in shape. Hopefully, there may be alternative transportation made available at some point. Well, sure. <laughs> um, how, how's it going in terms of hearing the, the questions? Okay, sorry. You had no comment there, sorry? Yeah, I moved to Niagara two and a half years ago as a retired charge nurse in long-term care in Oakville. I found out that there's a lot, really, that Niagara can offer to the senior citizen. Uh, at St. David, I found out that there's an exercise group for senior citizen in which the more attendees are, the more funding they get. So we just have to get ourselves motivated to attend that so we can get more funding for our own city of goodness for our health. Yeah, that's a that's a major theme this afternoon is motiv self motivation. Yeah. <laughs> you guys want to go forward now? So we're going to talk about um, the housing options. Now. So all your comments leads really well into our next session, which is on the housing option for frail older adults. Okay, so. We'd like to begin by sharing a quote from Anthony Dale, the CEO of the Ontario Hospital Association. And the quote says, many of the solutions to hospital overcrowding lie outside the hospital walls, and that there is a need to strengthen home and community care and reduce over-reliance on hospital and emergency departments. So basically what this quote is th saying is that in thinking about our hospital system, we must also think about the home housing options for older adults uh, and how why they're ending up in the hospitals. Okay. So here we have a figure from uh, the Ontario Financial Accountability Office that was made in November of 2019. And it shows the stats and the number of Ontarians over the age of 75 and the number of long-term care beds between the years of 2011 and 2018. And as you can see, there has been a significant growth in the number of Ontarians over 75. In fact, uh, has increased by 20% from 2011 to 2018. But if you take a look at the number of beds in long-term care homes, there hasn't really been the same increase. So there's two takeaways that we can have with this graph. The first being that uh, the number of long-term care beds uh, within Ontario is not keeping up with the changing demographics, which means that when people are coming out of hospitals, oftentimes there's a lack of accommodations outside of the hospitals for these people who are still in the process of recovery. And the second takeaway is that if you just look at the numbers, there's over a million Ontarians over the age of 75, but there are only 78,000 long-term care uh, beds. So a lot of times when the topic of senior care is brought up in politics, you know, uh, long-term care beds is the topic that's the most discussed. But what we like to say is that if you just look at the numbers, just increasing the number of long-term care beds is never going to be the solution to the problem. And instead, we should be focusing on a different variety of housing options for older adults. So here we have a spectrum of the available housing options for frail older adults. And <laughs> on the bottom, you can see that there's a scale uh, between uh, older adults that are completely independent to older adults that are more dependent. So for example, if you can see that living at home with family support is a housing option that can support older adults reg regardless of where they are on the scale. Uh, whereas for other housing options, they take people <coughs> based on the variety of their uh, current function and the level of support that need, they need. And from this, 
uh, what we want to say is that we should be focusing on increasing support for all of these housing options <coughs> instead of focusing solely on long-term care homes. Mm -hmm. And ideally, we want a community where all these housing options are relatively close to each other and so that uh, people can transition from different housing options depending on the level of support they need as they age. Okay, so, oh, and just to read the options, the options include uh, staying home with family, <coughs> continuing care retirement communities, and uh, independent living and supportive living, uh, home care and personal care assistance, and assisted living, and adult day programs where people can go away during the day to look for some source of support, and nursing home and long-term care facilities are at the bottom of the list for people who are more dependent and need higher levels of support. And here we have a picture of a man using an automated blood pressure measuring device to take his blood pressure at home. The machine is linked to his physician's office so that the physician can monitor his blood pressure as he takes it. So this is one of the options that Hannah will go into that can help older adults remain home for longer. Thank you. Um, so that all may sound nice to everybody, um, but practically, how do we make homes accessible um, to support adults who do have increasing levels of dependence? Um, so we do have a couple of suggestions here um, and, and different alternatives. Uh, the first one is retrofitting existing homes. So this can be something as simple as uh, putting in a shower bar to reduce the chance of, of slips and falls. Um, there's also uh, building new structures, and that can be you know, building ramps into, into homes. Um, it can also mean um, using models like uh, the Marriott Hotels, uh, which are currently um, any new building that they, they're building, they're making sure that the door frames are extra wide to accommodate for mobility devices. They're making sure that um, the ledge between rooms isn't a tripping hazard um, and, and that type of, of consideration of people who um, could potentially um, fall or require a little bit more support. Um, we, there are also policies and practices that can be improved so that people can live at home um, longer. Um, Technology-based approaches like uh, what Eva mentioned in terms of um, making sure that our, our medical devices can be linked to physician's office. It doesn't require uh, a visit every time they want to go and, and report back to their physician. Their physician excuse me. Um, and it could also be uh, implementing more smart homes uh, and smart technology in homes. Um, if the stove is left on for an extended period or the fridge is left open, making sure a loud alarm is ringing, uh, things like that. Um, and then there's all, there are also uh, incentives through zoning, policy, and funding, um, such as municipality um, buying up land and encouraging builders to build uh, affordable housing that is designed in a way for um, those who are older um, and requiring more assistance um, to make communities and homes there. Uh, and here we can see some friends retrofitting um, a house by adding a ramp um, at the front, making it more accessible for the person who's living there, or potentially even their friends to allow them more social interaction, let them uh, visit each other at home and actually get into the home. And we wanted to put this slide up again just to kind of summarize and remind everybody that nursing homes and long-term care facilities are not the be-all and end-all. They are not going to be the solution. We need to be more creative um, and we need to find solutions that will address all of these housing options so that there are places for everybody to live and not that huge gap between the 70,000 beds and over a million older adults. And um, the last point is, as we age, our interests, our likes, our dislikes, they change. We don't become new people. Um, older adults love interacting with kids, with puppies, just like 
younger people do. Um, and, and we can't forget that and pretend that they're a whole different species. We're all the same. <laughs> it's, it's a spectrum. Um, and, and let's make sure that we're all in this together, kids to older adults, um, all working together to make sure that aging is a wonderful and graceful process. Um, another question for you all, so we get some more discussion time. How can communities provide safe, relationship-centered support, promoting physical and brain health wherever they live? So I'll give you guys another two minutes to discuss and then ask you for your thoughts. <laughs> Okay, this lady here, sorry. Okay, I'm gonna take a totally different scope on this. Sure. I don't think it's up to communities, totally. The communities can be involved and can offer interest tied up to brown. <laughs> but it's up to, I think it's up to someone who is, whose loved one is maybe starting to be in decline. So that you can say, okay, she, she can't drive, but let's find out where the bus route is. It's not up to the community to come to me to say, well, your mother can get on that bus, right? It's not up to the community to promote it all. It's up to those of us who love our loved ones to look out for them and to say, okay, this isn't working. How about we look into it? We have counselors, we have all kinds of people who know stuff and who are well-informed. Go to them, say, don't expect the community to look after you. And I'm really sorry, I have to confess, I live at Pleasant Manor. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, you have, so you have a community around you. I have a community So then, yeah, so. This is, a, this is an opportunity for, for me to publicize the book I'm writing. Uh, it'll come out next year called Brain Ability, um, Preventing Dementia. And what we say for each of these different types of uh, of um, brain health uh, measures like um, having a healthy brain, um, having healthy tissue, and, and being engaged. There are actually four things you can do with each of those. Like, let's take smoking, for example. First of all, it's up to the individual, so there are things that they can do. Then second, the second level is their family, or their, as you're saying, their support people. The third is the community, but after they've done those first two, like you're su suggesting. And then finally, um, the health system. So um, maybe you haven't been successful in those first three and you go to your family doc and they might be able to help you. Or maybe our government. Well, the government pays for the last two. A lot of things government pays for, you know. Um, but I think that 
Can I just add something? Yes, So this lady, she's just been here a while, right? In Canada? No, no. In St. David's. In St. David's, yeah. okay. So when she chose to move to St. David's, she realized there are no buses, right? There's no bus in the community where I'm living at. Yes. Uh, not yet, probably next year. Okay. But you I'm inform yourself where you're living. Yeah. Okay. And if you're not, if you don't know, ask a neighbor. Ask someone at your church. Sure. Ask somebody. Sure. Don't ask the community or the government to always step in. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's a bit of both. Yes, it's a bit of both. Yeah, yeah, and I would add, I would, I would add that um, government isn't over there. It's in this room. Yes, you know? that's right. Uh, so we're, we're all the government. We all can pick up the phone, and we can always yeah. um, suggest things to government or follow through with things. So it's not an either-or thing. But I want to move on to the rest of the talk. Uh, thank you for your comments. Um, the f next one is the, what's, what many people are saying in Ontario is a human resources crisis. crisis. And um, this, is, uh, this is about support of frail older adults. And I want to um, point out that at the beginning I didn't mention this, but uh, my colleagues and I have decided to stop using the word care. <laughs> and it's really about support to help people help themselves. It's not about doing things for them. So um, governmental and non-governmental initiatives are uneven across Ontario municipalities. So some municipalities do really a lot of things, and other municipalities, there's not much going on. Provincial governments, media, and the public focus on one option, as we've heard, a long-term care homes. And that's not, quotes, the answer. Um, and uh, physical and brain uh, fitness gap issues too often are not part of the conversation. So, um, for example, Taber Manor um, in St. Catharines now has a, a fitness gym that they, they have some extra space. And that's the way I would like to think um, any place I'd go into that was a res residential facility, they would have places to, um, to uh, go to without going outside even. And we need local um, community leadership uh, mobilizing through local actions. And um, I guess I'm a bit frustrated with people saying the government and the Minister of Health, but that's a long way from Niagara and the Lake. <laughs> and we can do a lot more than we've been thinking about doing locally. So those are my thoughts about uh, those kinds of things. And uh, just to bring it back again, we need to work on this together. Um, kids, pets, and music are all very popular things. The next issue is recruitment and retention of people. Um, there are huge challenges in the system right now in terms of absenteeism and turnover of staff, particularly long-term care homes, but other types of facilities. And staff are quitting faster than they can be replaced. And this new facility of Virgil is looking for 300 new staff. Um, possible solutions will include recruiting more high school students, immigrants, and people changing jobs in mid-career, for example. Be pleased to talk about those in more detail later. Uh, collaboration with owners and <laughs> operators of these different housing options. Like, have we done enough with them to maybe expand their service or talk to them about what bylaws are st stopping them from doing more, etc.? And then finally, looking beyond paid staff to support to support frail older adults. For example, increasing volunteer coordination. As I mentioned, it's really a challenging thing. It's a good brain health exercise to volunteer, and even more so to, to coordinate volunteers. So that's, a, that's another thing that probably we haven't looked at hard enough in this whole issue of who supports frail people. I, I found this um, Niagara Workforce Planning Board, thank, thanks to the Lord Mayor, um, Betty DeCero. She pointed me to this, this organization I didn't know exist. But they keep a, a list of, of uh, all the jobs that are open in our community in Niagara and the Lake. Um, and uh, this went from 430 one jobs uh, related to supporting older adults to um, 567 uh, 2013 to 2017. Um, and the types of jobs available in 2017 are really interesting. Um, almost, uh, well, 30, 36 percent were home health care workers, 22 percent were individual family services, private households, six, nursing care facilities, six, and community care facilities for older adults. So. This is what our community is finding, the people that operate and own facilities and programs that support frail older adults, they need more staff. And um, it, as you see, there's a trend there from 2013 to 2017. And um, I didn't mention earlier, but the, the, the 2011 census in Niagara Lake uh, listed um, uh, that there were 
Uh, 500 people that were over 85 in 2016, that gone up to 700 people. Mm -hmm. um, and to, so in 2019, maybe that's close to eight or 900 people over 75. So again, pets and kids and getting outside and walking, notwithstanding our weather, um, but uh, that's really important to do. So, so what are the challenges in support of older adults? First of all, there's the family. Um, talking to people in the community, I find that they're very important. They're very much unaware of the importance of fitness. Um, I looked at a magazine in Shoppers the other day, and their answer to brain health was go and see a doctor. The answer to brain, the brain health is really um, get up and get going, which is what the motto is in Okinawa, which is as the longest life, uh, life um, uh, expectancy of any community in the world. Um, people are unfamiliar with those housing options. Like we hit this, we get, get, keep getting hit by the media and the press and, and politicians all about long-term care homes. It's not, it's about these other things that we talked about today. And finally, um, it's, it's a responsibility to support frail people, especially um, without knowledge, how can we do it? And we need to work harder at helping people help themselves and helping caregivers, et cetera. So that's one of the reasons we're here today is to talk about what could be done in that area. And finally, at the community level, um, the community is often unaware of the importance of the, fi of the fitness gap. And um, it would be a neat experiment, um, Cindy, to go and ask all the counselors what they know about uh, the fitness gap um, in, um, in Niagara and the Lake. Um, they're also unfamiliar with the housing options. Um, everyone stands up and says, well, we need more long-term care homes, but you wonder whether they're aware of these other kinds of housing. And finally, community leadership is needed to increase awareness about frail older adults, adults and to create new support systems. So um, this is the kind of community we like to have with people getting together and enjoying themselves and maybe learning a new instrument. That's very good for um, closing the fitness gap. So, so changing demographic, demographics requires new knowledge and training. Um, we're all here today because we're keen on um, having new knowledge and uh, we need to continue doing that. And, and um, Bill Brown's a champion of knowledge and uh, I commend him again about, for these uh, uh, info health sessions. But we need to emphasize the, phys you know, in, in um, future health practitioners need to be knowledgeable about um, the fitness gap, about caring for people with dementia, about violence prevention and addressing responsive behaviors and safety training. We've got some excellent examples in Niagara. Um, according to Caroline Trimster, the Dean of Health Studies at Niagara, apparently every group of students that comes in, um, about a thousand participate in a frail elders, older adult course about how to support people. And mo most recently, Conestoga College in um, Waterloo has just um, received ministry funding to support uh, increased training of personal support workers. And they give money to the long-term care home to to backfill the absent staff so they can they can go off and, and do the course. So um, again, the fitness the fitness gap is, is only uh, with brain health. It's it's use it or lose it kind of thing. Um, and I'll tell you about the uh, the uh, experience core. This is a randomized trial where they they had people over 65 randomly allocated to um, being part of a program to go into to schools and help primary students in the library with reading, et cetera. And another group, about 400 um, older adults over the 65 that they just left at home and didn't do anything. But at the beginning of the study, they measured their size of their brain and also the, um, their cognitive functioning and their quality of life. And it was really frightening because the people in the, in the non-experienced um, core group, um, their brain shrunk. <laughs> They weren't as, uh, as quick with uh, cognitive assessments and they weren't as satisfied as the experienced core group. So we live in a terrible uh, society where we've been told in our generation that life is about um, uh, going to school, going to work, and then retiring. But life isn't like that at all. We live now to almost um, 80 years of age and we have to think about reinventing ourselves. We should remove the word retirement from our vocabulary. Uh, if we want to have um, physical and brain health fitness. So, um, um, so the, 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 the takeaways here again are what I've just mentioned, 
we need the community-wide engagement. And so I wanted to talk about um, the next steps, which would be upstream community-wide strategies. Like, how can we, like, we're going to be um, in need of some of these more um, supportive kinds of activities. All the people in this room, you got here today, but maybe in the future, are, how are we gonna know that, that our community is able to help us? And so this is about two or three things. One is I call it reframing economic development in Niagara and Lake to include housing for frail older adults. Um, all the things I've seen so far about what Terry McTaggart, who is the co-chair of the economic development um, uh, task force that the mayor, Lord Mayor has put together, this hasn't been on his radar for that task force. And I, I think that, um, that economic development goes down the road of different housing options, for example. Or we've heard a lot about transportation. Maybe there's some private transportation opportunities for entrepreneurs to take, over, to take on here in this community. So there needs to be a lot of discussion about what we mean by economic development in, a, in the changing demographics. And then we've got, um, we've got Cindy Grant here, the chair of the Wellness Committee, a new committee that was set up earlier this year in Niagara-on-the-Lake. And um, we need to ask her about, um, about the things that they're putting together in their report that will specifically respond to the changing demographics in, in Niagara and the Lake. Um, so you might want to ask them about those things. They're here today. Um, and or Cindy is, anyway. Um, and then um, Terry McDaggart suggests that maybe we need a ginger group, he calls it, where this is a group of people who try to encourage other people to follow a new, more interesting, and more active way of doing things. And so over the next few weeks, months, I'm going to be talking to different groups in Niagara and Lake about how we might pull together a group of people that would take action on this. And, um, and finally, who can do this? Well, as we've talked about this afternoon, um, uh, for the upstream community-wide strategies, it, it comes back to individuals and families, as we've heard. Um, interest groups, uh, we've got faith groups, retirement associations, charities, service clubs, advocacy groups, we need to get this message out to them of what they could possibly do, and community leaders, both in non-governmental and governmental organizations. So um, we have, what time is it now? 2.41. So we have about 10 or 15 minutes to talk about what we've been talking about, and so uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. There must be a nice from this group. This group is never quiet. Um, I have a question. Could you just say a little more about the concept of the ginger group? Oh, well, that's a, that's a group of people who come together. Um, one of the things that, um, that uh, Terry McTaggart's done is he's, he's been part of this angel investor group, which is not too much different than this. They look for, for business opportunities for people who have startup companies. But we could have a startup company on private transportation, for example. But it's basically to bring people together who have, have an interest in all the things we've talked about this afternoon and start to um, try out new things in Niagara and the Lake. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. He's, he's, uh, his wife's here. There she is. And I'm Terry McTaggart. Yeah, sorry. I meant the, the, the husband or the male part of that family. It's very confusing. There are two Terrys you're in the family. You're both Terry, but you're married to each other and you're yeah. both Terry. Yeah. And I'm also on the wellness committee with Cindy, so we, we have interesting discussions at home. So he's, he's, um, he's the co-chair of the um, Economic Development Task Force. On the Lord Mayor. Um, yeah, the Lord Mayor. Um, has asked him and another person, I don't know who it is, but they are they're about to um, um, present their report. Um, it's, it's getting really close to, to that uh, outcome. Yeah. 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 Yes? Oh, there sorry. seems to be very, very little um, of housing availability for those of us who live in our own uh, separate individual homes into a comparable um, unit in this town and enjoy the standard of living that that individual house has given us in the past. There doesn't seem to be anything either on the drawing board or anything available at this point um, for that sort of, not, not upscale, but a reasonable scale of 
housing that's available that at that economic level. Yes, accessible housing. Yes. Can I just speak to that for a minute? I've lived in Niagara on the Lake since 1963 when this town was a normal functioning town with families and children, <laughs> and children went to school here. In the last 30, let's say 30 years, um, it has become a town of retirees. And I think the infrastructure for our community as we are now is just not here. I mean, Pleasant Manor is a wonderful place in St. Catharines. There's Chartwell, which has improved greatly over the years since I've known it was here, and also Upper Canada Lodge. But those kinds of houses and that kind of facility or buildings are just not here. I mean, perhaps if the school board hadn't sold our little Parliament Oak School, that could have been made into this kind of facility. Um, and as a friend of mine that I, I was a colleague with at the Shaw Festival, it used to say, in 25 years, we'll be living in the Shaw Festival. We <laughs> love the <laughs> so, um, so just to answer that, I've been here a long time, and I've seen how the town has changed, and we haven't been able to keep up with that. Kind but of. I think the reason I came this afternoon is that a lot of this has to do with knowledge and community awareness. And awareness. And so... As uh, Bill said, it's, this, is, this presentation is going to be on Kajiko a number of times and also available on YouTube. If you really feel strongly about it, what I'd recommend you do is you talk to at least one other person to have a look at this, uh, at this presentation and the discussion we've had this afternoon. Because it, it's going to take a lot of discussion to overcome some of the things you've just identified in terms of where the town is now and where it has to go. Yes, Cindy? Hi. I'm Cindy Grant, that uh, Larry was so kind to introduce in his slide. Just a little bit of a plug for the com uh, Community Wellness Committee. As Larry said, and Terry, and Terry is on it, and um, there's, it's a committee of nine people. So I am just, I'm the chair, I'm the spokesperson. I am not the only person on the committee. I'm speaking on behalf of the whole committee. We have been working all year. All, many of the things that we're talking about today are reflected in our report. Uh, we're making a report to council on January 20th to the council. It'll be open to the public, live streamed. Um, and we're making a series of recommendations. A big one is housing. Another big one is transportation. Another big one is environment. That hasn't come up today, but that's another key section of our report. Noise pollution chemical pollution, spraying, all of that kind of thing. Um, communication, um, social connectedness, just intergenerational social connectedness, reducing isolation, opportunities for more of that. Now, we're, we're making a report, we're gonna present it to council. You could, you could think to yourself, well, yeah, that's another report that's gonna gather dust on a shelf. Our committee is a, is a committee of council, so we've got a four-year term. So we've got a remainder of three years. And um, I would like to suggest that our committee will monitor these recommendations as they go to town staff, as they go to other, commu other committees, other groups, other areas in town. And we will monitor those, and we will put up a red flag. Um, we said this. This is six months later, I don't see anything happening. What's happening? So I would like to see to see our group as kind of a watchdog um, against all of these recommendations. But the kind of housing thing that you're talking about, that's that's clearly a very, a very firm recommendation in our council. The town needs to move. And it's not just the town, as Ingrid said, it's not just the town, it's the developers, it's it's a, it's groups getting together to say we need this, and then the private sector can come, come to the table and develop it. It isn't just all on town councilors and staff to make it happen. Um, but all I'm all I'm trying to say, I guess, is this kind of discussion is happening. It is happening at the council table, and awareness and communication of these issues um, is important because the more of us that go to our councilors and say we need it. 
the more, the more likely it is to happen, and then I'll be quiet. So you're going to be a burr under their saddle. I'm going to try to be. Okay. I'm going to try to be. So if I could say one one last thing, and that's um, I've I've talked to Bill about this, and also Terry McTaggart. Um, um, even even though we've got Kajiko and we've got YouTube, um, it takes more than that. It's like the, the the kind of dialogue we've had here this afternoon. So I'm I'm willing to um, go to other groups like this group. And, and have discussions about this because it's through, I think it's gonna have more power if people are talking about it, not just receiving the information. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if either now or later, if you um, could leave, give me uh, ideas of wh which groups we should get together with. Apparently there's a breakfast club, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a place where we can, yeah, well, so, so that's, um, that's my challenge to you is tell, tell us where we should um, be taking this, uh, this dialogue. Thank you very much well, for your... Oh, one more, one more question. Uh, we dismissed Department Oak saying rather quickly we've been a private investor, I guess is what he has, has taken it over. There's no reason that we can't... The land that they have, we can build quite an integrated uh, system right. with incorporating all of this. This is the Virgil facility. No, 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 it's, no, in no it's in Old it's in Old Town. Yeah. What was the name of the town? Parliament Oak School. It's an old school. Oh, I see. There's actually, actually a sign up on it now. They're asking no, it's for taken it down. down. Oh, it's really yeah. I think we should pursue that. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. couldn't have a better placed piece of property. Yeah, exactly. So it's just folks, what's the name? Yeah. Private guy has it. You can't do anything. Yeah. Well, anyway, that, that, that's, that's another burr under the saddle that the previous council didn't handle all that well, uh, unfortunately. But, uh, but, uh, but we need to keep after that. Anyway, I want to thank you very, very much, uh, Larry, for coming along. Dr. Chambers, you know. Uh, this is only the beginning of a conversation, and there already have been conversations in town. And, um, and I think the more we organize and become active, uh, the more that will happen. And if we're passive, nothing's going to happen. Um, and, you know, we all have our own experiences. We're all of a certain age. So we know somebody. We have a spouse. We have friends uh, that are cognitively or uh, physically challenged or both, uh, or just healthy aging. And, but they're on that slope that, uh, that Dr. Chambers mentioned. And we want to retain as we're much as we can for as long as we can. Slope. So yeah, well, we are, <laughs> unfortunately. Bill, yeah, can I just say one more thing? Yeah. Um, I noticed on some of your slides, Dr. Chambers, that family was very much highlighted. Yeah. Um, well, I can tell you that Ingrid might be unique in this, but Bill and myself and Terry and most, I'm going to stick my neck out and say most of the people who live in this town do not have family here. That's right. Well, the, I work with the Alzheimer's Society of Canada and their definition of family was um, either close relatives or the network of friends and supporters you mm -hmm. have. So family is a broader concept that I forgot to mention. Not blood, not yeah. I think there are a lot of people that don't want to ask for help when they need it. And I think it's up to those who are capable, those who are still able to drive, those who have just know somebody that can't, for example. I live with two people that, that don't drive anymore. And uh, for them to ask me for a ride is not the most comfortable thing. However, if I offer, and this is the, for those of us that are capable, if we can just simply make a phone call or talk to our neighbor or whoever it is and just say, hey, I'm going out, would you like to come along? Or if, if there's something you need, you need to get groceries, you know, why don't we do it together? I'm going Thursday, you wanna come along? Um, there are ways of those of us <coughs> who can help those who are just too, either too embarrassed or too uh, just reluctant to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And so they sit alone. And there's a lot of depression setting in. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, my husband lost his license three years ago, and he's very depressed. Yeah. That's yeah. a very good point. Yeah, uh, and I, I lost yes. mine too, and I'm a, I don't like to ask people to take me places. And uh, it's, it's humiliating because I've been selling the trainer for so many years. 
and uh, it, and there should be some kind of better sanitation for people who don't have the ability to drive their car anymore. We don't have an Uber know. in town. No. no. Is Uber available? Yes. Yeah. 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 And is it in yeah. Niagara Lake? Or yes. Yeah. 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 You have to use an iPhone yeah. to be yeah. able to call okay. mm -hmm. if your eyesight is and yeah. you can't operate yeah. an If you don't have an iPhone, yeah. Yeah. forget it. Well, I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you. Sorry. Thank everyone who's right. contributing to this, and so many people have. Yeah. The conversation can continue after, <laughs> but for the purposes of this program and Coach Co, it's an hour program, so that we really come to an end. So thank you again very, very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah.